We're now going to hear from Michigan and their public community spaces, um, Nate Scramlin and Catherine Sarnaki. Sarnaki. How is that? Close, close. Okay, Catherine, you tell us how to do it. <laughs> Good afternoon. On behalf of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, thank you for this opportunity. In 2014, Michigan faced a dilemma by confronted a dilemma by states and municipal governments across the country, declining public revenues and budgetary concerns. The questions we faced were these. One, how can we empower communities to support and invest in developing community spaces during difficult economic times? And two, how can we support communities so they can be an attractive place to live, work, and play? Our solution, public spaces, community places. PSCP has been a catalyst in raising funds for community projects from bike trails and boardwalks to community centers and gardens to playgrounds and pavilions to public art and farmers markets. We believe public spaces, community places is a 21st century approach that draws on the power of social media efficiencies while fostering civic pride and engagement that is immediate, effective, and provides a sense of community accomplishment. And I'm proud to say that Michigan is the first state government partnership to use crowdfunding. Uh, we found that by shifting the grant approval process to the local residents, the community engagement is increased and sustained. The appeal is simple. There's no government bureaucracy. There's no tedious forms. There's no frustrating red tape. Participation is immediate, accessible, and measur measurable. We believe that PSCP fundamentally changes the approach to community development. PSCP takes 48 hours for approval. Grant funds are then delivered within five days of the verification that all of the requirements have been met. So in contrast, a typical community development block grant process lasts maybe six months to a year. Um, this is straightforward, simple, efficient, and effective. So PSCP begins with the community identifying and then requesting funds for a project. To date, more than 60 communities across the state have participated in the program. Since 2014, the MEDC has invested $3.6 million in grant funds, while communities have raised an additional $4.3 million through our civic crowdfunding model. The average project goal is $33,000, and projects almost always raise more than their goal. On average, 117 people participate in the fundraising campaign. And in total, more than 5 million square feet of public space has been activated and reactivated in the state of Michigan. From contributing to the resurgence of Detroit to improving the lifestyle of small towns on the Upper Peninsula, our program helps build places that matter, which in turn helps the state of Michigan attract investment, build tax revenue, and retain talent. PSCP is vital in communities where local and municipal funding is limited. With tight budgets, placemaking projects are often low priorities. By supporting projects through crowdfunding, citizens are empowered to help shape their community's landscape and future. These additional dollars ensure a community's ability to con continue to support placemaking while focusing general fund dollars on public services and infrastructure. PSCP allows us to track public space reactivated and investment. We have realized that for every $1 in grant dollars, we leverage more than seven of uh, other private and public dollars. This program is a proven model for other states. So two states, Indiana and Massachusetts, are using the MEDC patronicity model and are reporting success. Carmen Lathig from the Indiana's Housing and Development, uh, Community Development Authority said the program, quote, generates a high level of public involvement and is widely successful in assisting local communities in becoming better places to work, live, and play. Mary Jones, CEO of Mass Development, said MEDC and patronicity's approach quote, brings a fresh, nimble perspective to how to invest in locally-led projects, end quote. So while PSCP offers a transferable model to other states and communities, it's also a model to nonprofits and foundations. At the John F. Kennedy School of Government, we are reminded that President Kennedy challenged us to get involved in public service. In the context of today's presentation, President Kennedy's challenge can be understood as do what you can to make your community and the world a better place, and in turn, your community will make you a better person. Before you today, we ask that you keep in mind that public spaces, community places, is inspired by the ideal of service, responsiveness, and transpar transparency, an efficient, effective community development approach, an approach that can be sustained and replicated by local, regional, and state governments. As measured by the many examples of success, there is no doubt public spaces, community places is making a dramatic and positive difference in Michigan communities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Linda. I have so 
so many questions. Right. Um, <coughs> um, um, I'll start with a tough one, which I, I, again is about the issues of opening up access um, to underserved communities. And, um, and so I guess I'm, I'm curious of what, um, what you can tell us about these projects and has there, what are the special challenges around communities that don't have as many resources, perhaps don't have the CBOs to um, advance the projects for them and what have you done or tried to do to, to address that as an issue from design or, you know, or has it been an issue? Sure, that's a great question. We were actually talking about this earlier. Interestingly enough, some of the wealthier communities, wealthiest communities in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Gross Point, um, Birmingham. Birmingham, have not used this program at all. Uh, we think that's because they can just go out and fund a project. Uh, people contribute, they do it on their own. Where we've seen the majority of projects come are cities that are distressed. And it's not the municipal governments coming forth, but it's those small community groups, the neighborhood organizations, such mm -hmm. as communities in Flint, uh, neighborhoods in Detroit, we've seen um, Lansing. All of those, all of those projects have come from neighborhood or nonprofits, and not the municipal government. And so we really feel that mm -hmm. by putting this uh, opportunity yeah. before them, those locals have that opportunity because Flint can't go out and do a public park um, on their with their municipal funding. I'm sure you all have heard of the situation in Flint. Um, Detroit also has other budgetary concerns. So. We actually think that the program itself just lends itself to more of those struggling um, communities and, and neighborhood associations. And, and why is it that um, you have to go through government or a nonprofit to advance a project? Like citizens can't sort of get their own group together and do it? Well, we wanted some sort of um, legitimacy to an entity. We, uh, it's a little bit of a protection for us as a state agency to make sure that we're not just giving John Smith money and there's no checks and balances to make sure what he does. As Nate mentioned, we turn around the money within five days. And so we want to make sure that there's some sort of entity receiving those dollars to make sure the project actually gets accomplished. Right. And we'll often find where a group will come together, a citizen led group, that will will recommend, hey, go out and work with the local Partner. nonprofit out there to bring your project in. Ooh. We also I do want to mention we tried and we when we first started we allowed for profit businesses because mm -hmm. we said what if there's a for-profit business that wants to do something that is around the public space? Mm. Um, it didn't really work out mm -hmm. as, as we hoped. So mm -hmm. we went back to just the municipal and the nonprofit model. So just a quick thing on that: it is a, would be has to be a 501c3. That yes, you yep. or a local municipality, a uh, downtown development authority, something like that. David. So one of the things that's so appealing about this to me is it involves probably thousands of citizens in volunteering and funding and making things happen in their community. Mm -hmm. Do you have any numbers or if not guesses about say when you wrote this there'd been 94 projects. What's the average number of people involved in funding, volunteering, somehow being active in each of those projects? Yeah, well, so I mean it, uh, on average we found that 117 people support each project, right? So. Wow. Um, I think Actually, we have a small town called Portland. Portland um, did a mill project where they you know, are hosting their farmer's market now um, and other community events. But we estimate that a quarter of their population actually donated to this, to this effort. Um, you know, we, they had change jars all over the place. Um, and they've just, I mean, really, the amount of community support that gets around these things is insane. And, um, and, and well, and you mentioned the REACH, the Lansing REACH Arts Center. This is a youth arts center where they came to us for their, their first project and we supported them, they were successful. So they uh, expanded their arts center. And the second time we kind of took a hard stance and said, well, we've already kind of activated that public space for you. Um, while well, they went and used the tool anyways without the government match and they were, ra they were able to raise another $30,000 on their own. So we've grown their support base. So how many completed projects are you up to now? 112 as of today. So it's 112. Yeah, well, could change tomorrow. <laughs> times 117 people, you've got something. Oh yeah, we're in tens 13, of thousands. 12 13,000 people in Michigan oh. have been involved. Yep, absolutely. Well, and I think on the REACH example, what they found the first campaign they did with us, more than half had never contributed to that organization At before. All. And mm -hmm. so just by virtue of doing that campaign and uh, that project, they now have a donor and friend pool that is grown substantially. It's sustainable. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, Pete. So uh, a couple of years ago, the, the grand prize winner of this uh, gathering was pr the participatory budgeting project. And in some ways, it feels like this is participatory 
budgeting and that a certain budget has been set to match, but instead of having the public choose the project, you're asking them to both choose it and co-fund it. Um, I'm curious about the, uh, the role that patronicity plays in this as well. You'd mentioned that one of the challenges you had was just setting up the legal framework by which this was right. possible. Um, talk a little bit about, again, to that replicability question, the, the legal relationship with the crowdfunding uh, platform and how what you learned either could be transferred or just given things that are unique in Michigan, uh, every state is going to have to go through their own process. Well, we actually, um, we have patronicity with us today, but when <coughs> we were talking with our um, site visit coordinator, literally Massachusetts and Indiana picked it up and moved it. Um, their funding stream is a little bit different where they get their match dollars from. But in terms of allowing the same process, it's virtually identical. Uh, so we think that other states could use this. We've kicked around the idea of using our CDBG dollars in this fashion as match. Um, it, well, and I think it's also scalable, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a state government that does it. If you think about a, any particular city that may have a community foundation that says, okay, I've got $200,000 that we wanna put towards the development and reactivation of public space. So they put that out there, they set their own parameters of say $10,000 is the top they will fund. Well, then you've got 20 projects um, now that could be utilized just in that community. I mean, you can do it all, at all levels of government, in my opinion. Do you have any sense of what percent of these projects would happen without the public money? I mean, that's a, good, that's a good question. I mean, I think that it's interesting looking at the size of the project. So for example, our first project was a Detroit alleyway. And when I talked about the leverage ratio, uh, that we look at the total project. So the total project was $200,000. They had received a, a donation from a company called Chinola. And so they, the nonprofit, went out and said, OK, if we raise 50 from our neighbors, um, the MDC will match it. And so. Uh, that project essentially leveraged other funding sources and without, I mean, they could have gone out to fundraise. Uh, I think it just makes it a little bit easier in terms of filling that gap where the last money in. Uh, but in smaller projects where we, we do, up, um, sm the smallest project is $5,000. Uh, we've seen it's all or nothing. So, you know, a small project like a trailhead in a very small rural community, they have to raise the 5000 entirely or else it wouldn't happen at all right. because they need our money. So right. it really depends, I guess, on the, on the size and scope I, of the project. I think it would be a little naive to say none of them would happen, right, right if it wasn't for us. But I think, you know, it's it, this tool really, it's all about we want to make these community vi communities vibrant now, right? We don't want to wait. We're in Michigan. We want to attract talent. We want people to come to our mm -hmm. state. So we're implementing this tool to make it happen faster. Mm -hmm. and so the next, so one, I hope this is not an unfair question. How do you know that the results have made communities more vibrant? Like, ha, is there any evaluation to go and look at those 112 and see whether they're in fact being used, whether they've transformed a, a place, a block, whether citizens are engaging in those places in different ways? Yeah, I think that we actually, when we went, we took Barbara around and we went to the Portland Red Mill looking at that project in terms of how the community has rallied around this space. And Portland's a community of around 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, they are still active. They are making sure that nobody does any graffiti on the building. They have community events. I mean, the, the level of continued participation is really, really fascinating. And we do make sure, one other thing that's really important to us, it is immediate. We don't want to fund a project and have it sit there. You know, we want to be able to see in two weeks they have shovels in the ground, or in a month the project is done. And so, working with patronicity and our, our field staff at MEDC, we make sure that those projects are actually turning over. And we do case studies on every single one to show the before and afters. So oh. you go back and to look at utilization. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It was great okay. to hear about all the participation and the new projects and uh, the revitalization. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.